Again, thank you for joining us this morning. We are uh, continuing our series in the attributes of God. Uh, last week, we covered God's faithfulness. This week, we are covering God's goodness. And did anyone not get a handout? Green sheet? All right. I like to open with a uh, definition of the word uh, that's being used for God's attribute that we're covering this week. Uh, and I like to use Webster's 1828's American Dictionary of the English Language, uh, which uh, the name Webster is very familiar to, to many people in the United States, but uh, Noah Webster himself uh, sadly is uh, not as well known as he used to be. He was a Christian and he worked much of scripture into that dictionary. So the 1828 publication of his dictionary is full of references to scripture. That's where I like to pull my definitions from. So we are covering God's goodness this week, and I'll go ahead and read that definition out of the 1828 dictionary. Goodness, noun, the state of being good, the physical qualities which constitute value, excellence, or perfection, as the goodness of timber or the goodness of a soil. Further definitions, definition one, the moral qualities which, which constitute Christian excellence, moral virtue, or religion. The example, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith, from Galatians 5. Definition number two, kindness, benevolence, benignity of heart, but more generally, acts of kindness, charity, humanity, exercise. Example, I shall remember his goodness to me with gratitude. Three, kindness, benevolence of nature, mercy. The Lord God, abundant in goodness and truth, from Exodus 34. And finally, kindness, favor shown, acts of benevolence, compassion, or mercy. God's goodness is not a reference to his moral goodness, that is, God's holiness that results in his righteous acts. God's goodness is his benevolent treatment of his creation. So, uh, just to clarify, we're not saying God is good because he is holy, Actually, that is true. God is good because he is holy, but his holiness and his goodness are not quite the same attributes. They are interlinked, they are inseparable, but his holiness is a different uh, realm or region of his attributes from his goodness. How do we observe God's goodness in his creation? And that, that is a question at large to, to all of you if uh, you'd like to give an example. Well, you mentioned the Same. dirt, the, the goodness yeah, the, of the dirt. The goodness of soil. Of, of soil. <laughs> and, and it produces that which is good. Amen. Now, uh, we tried growing tomatoes when we lived over in Sassoon Valley. Uh, of course, Sassoon Valley is agricultural, but where we live, no one had told the soil in a long time. It was just hard clay. We could not get a garden to grow. But uh, we're working on a... Uh, uh, I call it Container. containers. Yeah, uh, there's another phrase for it. But we're working on a garden at home right now. We bought some uh, uh, containers, and uh, already we're getting. After a week, we're getting uh, stuff to sprout. And the, the difference in the soil is uh, just, just notable. It's, it's much richer. Anyone else can uh, can give an example of God's goodness? Sheila. No, I just said, I just was telling myself I have a heart. Everything. Everything. Amen. God created the universe and all that's in it. And there's a preponderance of evidence that this little ball, this tiny little ball floating through space is the only one with life on it. And he created all of it so that we might live. There's a, just a little bit of variance one way or the other and this planet will support life. A little bit of difference in the size of the sun or the output of the sun, life here would die. Whether from too much light or not enough, from too much radiation or not enough. Uh, rain, sunshine, good food. Jessica and I went out to uh, dinner last night and uh, tried one of the uh, new restaurants downtown, Moxie, and uh, uh, the food was excellent. Try the lamb. <laughs> Uh, the croak of frogs, the chirping of crickets, a splashing stream, the laughter of family. You think of Ellie's laughter, and she's laughing a lot now. God is good. 
How do we observe God's goodness in the spiritual realm? Again, feel free to give examples. Betty? Well, I don't know if this is what you mean or not, but spiritual indication. I, it thrills me every morning, well, every night. I go to bed saved, and I wake up saved. Amen. I, and I'm just so thrilled with, with that. I, every morning. I the assurance of salvation. Him, and for keeping me saved, the Holy Spirit just indwells. It's Amen. Amen. Sheila, were you going to say something? No, I was saying <laughs> prayer. That's Same. Amen. Yeah. Work of sanctification. Amen. You know. So uh, some more examples. God's mercy, his grace, his forgiveness, his love, the gift of his son, and his word. And the word is the word is a physical gift, of course, but it's also the basis for spirituality for all of us. Uh Take an excerpt from uh, Tozer's Knowledge of the Holy. When Christian theology says that God is good, it is not the same as saying that he is righteous or holy. The holiness of God is trumpeted from the heavens and re-echoed on earth by saints and sages wherever God has revealed himself to men. However, we are not at this time considering his holiness, but his goodness, which is quite another thing. The goodness of God is that which disposes him to be kind, cordial, benevolent, and full of goodwill toward men. He is tender-hearted and of quick sympathy, and his unfailing attitude toward all moral beings is open, frank, and friendly. By his nature, he is inclined to bestow blessedness, and he takes holy pleasure in the happiness of his people. If God is not good, then there can be no distinction between kindness and cruelty, and heaven can be hell and hell heaven. The goodness of God is the drive behind all the blessings he daily bestows upon us. God created us because he felt good in his heart, and he redeemed us for the same reason. Let's go to uh, Roman number one in our outline, God's witness to his goodness. Uh, we'll be turning to Psalm 119, verse 68. And then after that, Psalm 119, verse 39. And while you're turning there, just to recap, uh, God created us because he felt good in his heart and he redeemed us for the same reason. It's God's goodness that uh, brought about creation and brought about our redemption. So Psalm 119, verse 68, if I get someone to read that for us. Thou art good and doest good. And does someone have verse 39? Put away my reproach, which I fear, for thy judgments are good. Yeah. Thou art good and doest good, thy judgments are good. So let's look further. Uh, Romans 7, verses 12 and verse 16. Someone read verse 12, please. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. And verse 16. If, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. We're speaking of the law. The law is holy, the command holy and just and good. And then if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. God is good and does good, and his law is an evidence of that goodness. Remember that the purpose of God's law is not primarily for us to keep. It's impossible for us to keep it. But it's to illustrate that we need Christ. No human being can perfectly fulfill the law. Christ fulfilled the law. 
Let's go to Psalm 106, verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Praise ye the Lord, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. For he is good, his mercy endureth forever. And we're going to uh, read a number of verses here. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. <clears throat> and you will see a theme amongst all these. So uh, from Psalm 106, 7, or excuse me, Psalm 106, 1, we're going to go to 107, 1. Thank you, Sheila. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his mercy endureth forever. Then we're going to go to Psalm 118, verse 1, and then 118, verse 29. I give thanks unto the Lord for he is good, because his mercy endureth forever. And if you look at 118, verse 29. I give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. You're seeing a theme here. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's keep going. Psalm 136, verse 1. <coughs> Many of the Psalms were written by David. Uh, and I actually, now that I think of it, I should have looked at each one of these Psalms and determined who the writer was, but I assume that. Uh, it might have been the same writer for each of these, but Psalm 136, verse 1. Let's look at that. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Amen. Okay, now, uh, let's go to 1 Chronicles uh, 1634. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy. And Second Chronicles seven verse three, and that'll be our oh excuse me, uh, second to last one. Second Chronicles seven verse three. <coughs> and when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord from the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worship and praise the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Okay, and last one, Jeremiah 33, verse 11. Yes, you are. Keep going. The voice of the bride, the voice of them that shall say, Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And of them that shall bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord, for I will cause to return to captivity of the land as at first, saith the Lord. So over and over again, we see in Scripture that God is good four times in Psalms, twice in Chronicles, and again in Jeremiah, we see God's mercy tied to his goodness. If emphasis is made through repetition, then eight times over, we are told that God's goodness comes through his mercy. We do not receive that which we deserve because God and God alone is good. So let's look at Mark 10, verse 18. Probably heard this quite a few times. <coughs> Mark 10, verse 18. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. There is none good but one, and that is God. And of course, Jesus is God. 
and he was correct in calling him good. So God alone is good, and his mercy comes out of his goodness. Let's look at uh, Genesis 1, verse 31. This is creation. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and the evening he did, and the morning was six sixth day. It was very good. And Psalm 145, verse 9. <laughs> the Lord did to all, and his tender mercies are, all, are over all his works. <clears throat> the Lord is good to all, and again, you see his mercy are over all his works. So God created everything very good. The disasters that we see about us are the result of man's rebellion against God. A fallen world has deteriorated from its perfection as designed by God. And yet God is still good, and he's good to all. If we look at James 1, verse 17, and I'll take this one. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And there it uh, ties into... God's immutability, which we covered. God does not change. God's goodness does not change. God is never going to be any more good than he is now. He's never going to be any less good than he is now. We can count upon his goodness. So every good gift comes from God. Conversely, Satan, the world, and our flesh constantly attempts to convince us that God is not good and that something out there that is good for us is being withheld from us. This is the original lie from the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3, verses 4 and 5, where Satan tempts Eve and says, surely you won't die. God's trying to keep you from knowing what he knows. He's telling you, God's withholding something from you. God's, God withholds nothing from us. God is good. This is, this is the lie that there's somehow something out there uh, that's good for us is being withheld. It's simply not true. Let's go to Deuteronomy 30, verse 5, and then verse 9. Deuteronomy 30, And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good, and multiply thee above thy fathers. Verse 9. The Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every work of thy hand, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy, thy land, for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good, as he rejoiced over thy fathers. So he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. And in the fruit of the land for good, for the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good, as he rejoiced over thy fathers. So God blessed the Israelites. Similarly, he blesses us today, especially for those of us who live in the United States. Let's consider Numbers 6, verses 24 through 26. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Uh, I was given a link to globalrichlist.com. That thing is no longer active. However, in searching, I came upon another site uh, that I believe is tied to that. And uh, you can actually put in your own uh, parameters and find out where you stand in the grand scheme of things. For example, if you have a household income of $85,000, and you have two adults and one child, 2.8%, if you live in the United States, 2.8% of the people globally are richer than you. However, you're richer than 97.2% of the people in the world. You are in the richest 2.8% of the global population. Your income is more than 13 times the global mean. You live in the United States, you make about 85000 a year. 
you are 13 times more rich than the average person in the world. The United States was founded and built upon God's principles. Today we enjoy a momentum from that foundation, but as our culture turns from God, we see the mercy of God diminish and the greatness of our nation fall downward accordingly. Only Jesus can save the nation. We are still greatly blessed. There is a trend today uh, for people to be upset. You look at gas prices, you look at the cost of food. Things seem to be spiraling out of control. However, if we consider carefully what we enjoy on a daily basis, the fact that we have lights and power and amplified music, amplified audio, we can broadcast this on the internet. Uh, we come and go in comfort in cars on well-maintained roads. We live in homes that uh, we enjoy peace and quiet. We are blessed. God is good. God has blessed our nation. God continues to bless us on a daily basis. We wake up every day uh, in our own beds. We have much to be thankful for. God is good. Only God can save our nation. We need to acknowledge God. We need to repent. We need to follow him. And we need to ask God for revival. And God needs to revive the church. And through reviving the church, revival will come in our nation. Politics are downstream of culture. You have to fix the culture before you can fix politics. And in order to fix the culture, only God will be capable of doing so. God is good. We're all here today. The sun rose today, and we all woke up today. And we are here with no fear of persecution. There are people all over the world that if they met like we are today, would be greatly in fear of persecution and might be in prison for what we're doing. Let's turn to uh, Psalm 34, verse 8. taste and see that the Lord is good. God wants us to experience and enjoy his goodness. So uh, the thought of uh, honey comes to mind. It's, uh, not only is it, does it taste good, but it's good for you, especially if uh, you have allergies. It helps with your allergies if it's uh, made locally. You get a little bit of exposure to all the uh, pollen that the bees have harvested and it's integrated into that honey and it goes into your system and, and it helps you. So God is good and it helps us uh, spiritually, he helps us physically, he helps us every day as we wake up and go about our day. Let's uh, look at Jeremiah 10 through verse 14 and I'll go ahead and read that for us. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me, when, Jesus, when ye shall search for me with all your heart, and I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations, and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again into the place whence I cause you to be carried away captive. This illustrates that while God has a good plan for us, it requires our cooperation in seeking submission, and, as it said, search for him with all of our heart. On our part, as Daniel displayed in Daniel 9, verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years 
whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So Daniel came about his understanding of God's plan for him and the children of Israel by seeking it out in written records, specifically the writings of Jeremiah. So from this we know that God is reserving the richest blessing, excuse me, uh, next point, God is reserving the richest blessing for eternity when we can enjoy them completely. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9. <coughs> Can I have someone read that for us? What is the address again? Uh, First Corinthians two verse nine. I has not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. We don't have any idea what God has for us, for those of us that love him. If we look at Revelation 21 through 22, the last two chapters of Revelation, the last two chapters of Scripture, a description of the end of all time and the creation of the new heaven and the new earth, God dwells with mankind. There's no more death, sorrow, pain, or suffering. It's an illustration of an incredible city, the New Jerusalem, of God's will for our time spent with Him, going on into eternity. And it's the, there are things written there that we can barely imagine. It speaks of streets of gold, walls of uh, exotic jewels. Things that we can't even, we can't perceive. Uh, there, there are quantities of uh, exotic and precious uh, metals and, and stones that are unthinkable. This is what God has for us. God is good. Uh, going to our student handout under Roman numeral two. Blank of God's goodness. Someone. Like to take a guess at what that is. Blank of God's goodness. Scott? Examples. Examples of God's goodness. That's correct. So fill that one in. And you can see uh, item A under that, causing the sun to rise, sending rain on the just and the unjust. And we certainly uh, here in California appreciate the rain when it comes, don't we? Okay. God has taught me to appreciate rain. I hated it when I was a kid. Because that means I couldn't go outside and enjoy the sun. And I lived in San Jose, which is in a rain shadow. The rain comes over the Santa Cruz Mountains and into the Santa Clara Valley. And by the time the clouds get there, they have been scraped free of any rain. So we would get sometimes two weeks of no sunlight and no rain. Just high steel gray overcast and no rain. And it drove me crazy. <laughs> and I just dislike over, overcast skies. Now, when the rain comes... Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord for rain. Just rain alone. And, of course, while it rains on us here in Vacaville, it also rains in Sacramento, and uh, our governor gets rained on as well. well. Praise the Lord for his mercy. May God change the governor's heart. He is the only one capable of doing so. Amen? So going to uh, item B under Roman numeral 2. Uh, an example of God's goodness. Putting Joseph in prison. And the initial thought is, how is that an example of God's goodness? Consider, Joseph was put in prison so Potiphar's wife could no longer tempt him. Additionally, at that time, adultery or uh, seducing another person's spouse was cause for being put to death. Joseph was not put to death. He was put in prison. Moreover, he was... <coughs> Put in charge of the prison. Moreover, he was put in charge of the prison by the captain of the guard, who incidentally was Potiphar. 
Potiphar, instead of executing uh, Joseph, put him in charge of the prison and got him away from his wife. That's God at work. God, instead of allowing Joseph to die for something that he wasn't guilty of, put him in a safe place. So putting Joseph in prison uh, is the uh, example there on uh, item B on our own email too. Uh, and eventually, of course, we know the story of Joseph. He would, he would uh, meet the cupbearer, Pharaoh's cupbearer, uh, in prison and the cupbearer would eventually uh, introduce Joseph to Pharaoh to interpret Joseph, uh, excuse me, Pharaoh's dream. And of course, that led to Joseph being second in command over all of Egypt and the architect of saving most of the known world from an incredible famine and bringing his brother, brothers and father back to him and reuniting his family. Another example is uh, the manna in the wilderness. And of course, uh, we see God's mercy tied directly to his goodness. Uh, the Israelites complained to Moses that they had nothing to eat. And instead of God's wrath being kindled against them, he sent a very unique form of food to them where there was no food. And it fell literally from the sky. Fresh. And it was fresh. And if you didn't collect it in time, it would spoil. And it was just enough for one day. And then on Sunday, the day of the rest, you would gather twice as much the day prior. You would gather twice as much Sunday versus Saturday. But basically, the day before the Sabbath, twice as much would follow. You'd gather twice as much. And that particular harvest would last you through until after the Sabbath. And of course, God at work. Perfect architecture. And his goodness. So, uh, going to uh, item D under Roman numeral two. Jesus' ministry, as we see in uh, Matthew twenty three and twenty four and Acts ten thirty eight. Excuse me, Matthew four twenty three through twenty four. So Jesus' ministry, we see teaching in synagogues, preaching the gospel, healing all manner of sickness and disease, diseases, torments, possessed, casting out demons, uh, people who had lost their mind. People who had lost their mind <clears throat> regained their sanity. That is, that's uh, separate from demon possession or being tormented by a uh, a demon, he restored people to sanity. Uh, he would heal people with palsy. I, I have a friend who actually uh, suffered from cerebral palsy and it only affected his legs and it twisted his feet and turned them inward and, and sort of upward. He, and he can walk and he is determined to walk. Uh, and I watched him push himself very hard sometimes. But can you imagine Jesus just touching him on those feet, straightening him out? That's the goodness of God. And we don't have the technology to do that today. We don't possess the medical technology to correct his, his ailment. But Jesus was a great physician, and he healed all these people. The goodness uh, personified in Jesus' ministry. Uh, 
Uh, looking at Acts 10, verse 38, I'll read that one for us. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So we look at item E. Uh, Ephesians 4, verse 27, I'll read that, and then we can fill in the blank. But God, who is rich in mercy, again, there's the mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So, what do you think item E is? What is that gift? Christ is that gift. Yeah. Or salvation through Christ. So we now go to the applications, our response to the message. On the uh, sheet we see, trust God that his will is good. Wait patiently on him. And remember the story of Joseph. And then immediately following that, be a blessing to others. As we are blessed, let us bless others. As God is good to us, let us be good to others. In Ephesians 6, we're told that the shield of faith quenches all the fiery darts of the devil. Those fiery darts are unbelief. It often begins when we believe that God is withholding something good from us. And you can look in Psalm 34.10 and Psalm 84.11. Do not believe Satan's lie that to get some good gift we must depart from the path of God's will. Psalm 84. Psalm 34.10 and Psalm 84.11. Now that concludes our message today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for your participation. And thank you for your prayer request. Betty, do you have a question? Uh, I'm um, under Roman numeral 2 uh, E. What was that below? Item E. And by just a moment. Salvation. Salvation is a gift. Did anyone else need uh, one of the blanks for it? Let's uh, close in prayer and then uh, we can dismiss and get ready for the uh, service. Lord, thank you for your message to us today. Thank you for uh, your mercy. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for all the signs of your goodness that you've put all around us each and every day, Lord. This is the day you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, Lord. Uh, Put upon our hearts a thankfulness uh, for your goodness and a desire to serve and follow you. Please, please uh, bless our time together here today. Uh, open our hearts to uh, further messages that you have for us. And uh, may we bless each other and uh, lift each other up and encourage each other. And we ask all these things in the name of your Son Jesus. Amen.